Now, what kind of a world would it be if there was no X? <clears throat> I think I'd be out of a job. Because I think of myself as a storyteller, and for most of my adult life, I've been telling stories originated by others, and mostly in the form of films for both big and small screens. None of the stories I've told could even exist if there wasn't an X, an unknown, somewhere hidden inside them. And the very nature of stories is that the protagonist needs to discover something that they hadn't either expected or anticipated within during the course of their journeys. An example that immediately comes to my mind is from Francis Ford Coppola's wonderful film, The Conversation. In this, Harry Cole, the lead character, is convinced that a couple is going to be murdered, but then he discovers that they are instead the murderers. But X plays a part, not just in storytelling, but in influencing the direction all our lives take. In real life, it can come out of nowhere, take us completely by surprise, and radically affect, sometimes totally destroy, whatever plans we might have made for our futures. And often there's absolutely no rhyme or reason where, why these things are happening, why our worlds are being turned upside down by these bolts from the blue, these acts of God. In stories, however, the situation is rather different. Nothing ever happens by accident in any story, simply because everything that does happen, including the acts of God, have been put there by the storyteller for a good reason. Let's just have a look at a, an example or two of real life for a moment. Towards the beginning of the 20th century, a man in a town in the north of India had managed to build up a very successful business as a cloth merchant. Things had gone more or less as he had planned for him in matters of business. In his personal life, things were a little bit different. What he wanted was to ensure that the business he'd built up would continue to exist after his death. And for that, he wanted a child, someone who could inherit it and take it on for future generations. And he had a rather a traditional patriarchal mindset, so he wanted a son. Now, the first woman he married very sadly died without bearing him any children. But then so did the second and the third. Now, quite why and how they died, I don't know, and I'm not sure I really want to. But anyway, by the time his third wife died, he was in his late 40s, and with life expectancy being what it was in India then, time seemed to be running out for him to achieve his ambition. But he wasn't a man for giving up, so he arranged for himself a fourth marriage, and this fourth wife of his was considerably younger than him, and with her arrival, his luck changed, and she bore him not one, but two sons. And when the oldest boy was eight, and the younger one five, the man collapsed and died. Completely unexpectedly, I believe, of a heart attack. A bolt from the blue, if ever there was one. Now, if he had lived in a world where there was no ex, I would have loved to have asked him, what would he have done had he known he was going to die as and when he did? Well, of course, I didn't know him. But with the little information I have about his character, I can speculate. But speculation, you know, presents you with a whole bunch of choices, some of which may or may not be interesting or indeed insightful. So in my fanciful moments, I like to imagine perhaps he had a revelation, you know, a little like St. Paul on the road to Damascus, which led him to turn his business into a workers' cooperative. And then maybe he could have married just the one, simply by waiting for the woman who did become his fourth wife to be old enough, then have the kids, and then turn the business into a workers' cooperative, if only to prove to the world that nepotism wasn't on his agenda. But you see, the thing is, you're learning far more about me and my crazy imagination than anything remotely insightful about the guy. 
But that's also revealing another essential characteristic of stories, which is that the story and the person telling the story are inseparable. But if the facts that I told you about the man were instead a work of fiction, then I think we would ask ourselves some very different questions. And the first of these probably would be, what the hell is this story all about? And uh, if everything happens in a story for a reason, then we, it would help us to know why we are being asked to listen to this one. So is it about the punishment of a man by the gods for his vanity? Or is it about the futility of making plans? Or is it simply that, well, shit happens? And to that, we might say, yeah, big deal. Tell me something new. And anyway, why should we give a damn about this guy? What's so great about him that we should care whether he lives or dies? And if he has to die, then surely we need to know something about the effect of his death on his kids and on his wife. So you see, constructing works of fiction also means confronting a whole bunch of options, of choices, and then deciding which of them most meaningfully convey the point the storyteller is trying to make, all the while remembering to ensure that there's an X to be discovered by the protagonist, whoever he or she might be, that leads to some kind of a change. But anyway, let's go on with some reality. Now, I hate saying this, but the death of their father was probably the best thing that could have happened to these boys. Growing up without the presence of a dictatorial patriarch, they were free to choose their own paths in life, not least because they had the full support of a loving mother. At the time of the man's death, India was ruled by the British. But the struggle for independence was well and truly underway. And the actions and ideas of those fighting British rule infected the boys, albeit in different ways. Inspired by the teachings of Marx and Lenin and wanting an independent India that was also egalitarian, the oldest became an ardent communist. A younger boy also wanted an independent, egalitarian India. But he was drawn much more to the ideas of nonviolence as espoused most famously by Gandhi. What united both of them was that neither, unlike their father, had time for capitalism. And the result of this over the period of time was that they as good as gave away virtually all of their dad's business empire. Had he not been cremated, I'm sure he'd still be spinning in his grave, probably wondering what on earth he had done to deserve such punishment from the gods. As the boys and their mother were coping with life without the cloth merchant, over in Manchester, in the north of England, an orphan boy, working class, brought up by his grandparents, left school and joined the army. Now, this was in the mid-1930s. Around this time, he met a girl, also from Manchester, and the two of them became an item. But in 1939, as we know, the Second World War broke out, and his regiment was posted to Singapore. A comrade in arms, who was also his best friend, was going home on leave, so the soldier gave him a ring to give to the girl. It was an engagement ring, and she was delighted to receive it. But before the love of her life could also come home on leave and they could get married, the Japanese invaded Singapore, the British garrison surrendered, and the soldier and his comrades were all taken prisoner and made to work on the notorious Burma Railway, suffering the most terrible abuse and torture. And as we know, many people died. The soldier, however, did everything he could to stay alive, which included stealing food at every opportunity. Gradually, the tide of war turned, and leaving it extremely late, good luck also decided to make an appearance for him. As he was on the point of death, the prison camp the soldier was in was liberated by Allied forces. And then he learned that the woman to whom he had sent that engagement ring was still waiting for him in Manchester, despite not knowing whether or not he had survived the Japanese occupation of Singapore. Finally reunited, they decided to get married as quickly as they could. 
And the first meal she lovingly cooked for him included rice pudding. No sooner had she put the bowl in front of him than he picked it up and threw it across the room. And she realized pretty quickly that perhaps for the time being, rice needed to stay off the menu for a man who had been a prisoner of the Japanese. Now, you're probably wondering, what on earth is the point of this? Why am I telling you these anecdotes? So I'll try to be as succinct as I can. But I think it's only fair you know that the second son of the cloth merchant was my father, and the soldier, my father-in-law, and obviously his wife, my mother-in-law. Now, how they became my in-laws involves another series of events in which X played a very significant role, but I can assure you it has played just a significant role in ensuring the presence of each and every one of us in this extraordinary auditorium today. I should add, though, that had it not been for my paternal grandfather's sudden and unexpected death, it wouldn't be me you are listening to today. But do any of these accounts really qualify as stories? Can we categorize them as story? Or are they simply a series of events linked together by chance and coincidence? Now, Frank Daniel, a Czech, screenwriter and wonderful teacher, paraphrased Aristotle's definition of story in this way. He said, a story is the pursuit by a character of a conscious objective during the course of which he or she discovers a need, usually in the form of a human value. And that need is usually in conflict with the objective which forces the protagonist to make a choice, continue with the pursuit of the objective or go with the need. The point is a change has to take place. The, the character has to undergo a change. He or she has to learn something they weren't aware of, either about themselves or the world they inhabit, or possibly even both. But they must see the, gain a new perspective, see the world in a somewhat different light. Now, the characters in my accounts were definitely driven by objectives that they needed to attain at various stages of their lives. And I've no doubt that the experience of their pursuits changed them and presented them with dilemmas, which meant having to make difficult, even painful choices. So we could say that my anecdotes are a collection of stories, self-contained episodes, if you like, set within their own time frame. And as the characters were presented with difficult, painful choices, we can assume that the stakes must have been high for them. And the higher the stakes, the better it is for any story. Otherwise, the consequence of failure would be of no big deal to the protagonist, and that would mean it would be, their fates would be of no big deal to us, the audience. And what else can make a story worth hearing. Well, when my father-in-law heard about the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he was appalled, horrified. Despite everything he went through at the hands of his Japanese captors, I never once heard him say a single vindictive thing against the Japanese people. And he never lost his sense of humor. He would make us laugh, even when recounting the most horrific incidents he had endured so the fact that he retained his humanity is surely more than enough qualification to make his experiences as a prisoner of war worth hearing. And then if we decide that we're going to tell a story set in a prisoner of war camp from the point of view of a single individual, we, it would be worth remembering that each and every one of us sees the world differently. The way my father-in-law saw things was very different to the way his comrades saw them, even if they went through exactly the same or very similar experiences. Of the prisoners that survived, many harbored very negative feelings towards their captors and to the ends of their days regarded all Japanese people as inherently cruel. Now, my father-in-law may well have felt similarly at various stages during his four years of captivity. However, despite almost dying at the hands of his captors, 
he left the camp, seeing those who had treated him and his comrades so appallingly, not as monsters, but as human beings who were capable of being monsters, but who finally were not so very different from him. So a change took place in him as he came to a much more profound understanding of what it means to be a human being. Now surely there's an X well worth discovering in any story. I guess the point I'm trying to make about all this is that the things, you know, the things that he had to endure were probably unknown to him. The things that his experiences were things that were unknown to him, but were they unknowns for others, those in positions of power, who took the decisions that had such a profound effect on his and his life. So, you know, the X of reality, which brings us both joy and grief throughout our lives, is in my opinion, you know, is my, in my opinion, is to be celebrated. After all, it has been the driver of invention, innovation, discovery, and creativity in every, every field of human endeavor. I think the problem starts when the unknown, or X, is X for the vast majority, but not for all. And thankfully, plenty of people around the world have seen it as their duty to expose situations where what seemed to be unforeseeable or a bolt from the blue was no such thing. Now, the unknown in the kind of stories I, as a professional filmmaker, like to tell is rather different. In those stories, X exists for a very specific purpose. It is there to be discovered by the protagonists in order for them, to, uh, in order to have revealed to them something about themselves. Help them, and therefore us, the audience, see the world we inhabit in a somewhat different light. And two examples of this that have inspired me, and indeed many other filmmakers are, firstly, uh, Vittorio De Sica's seminal film, The Bicycle Thieves, in which Ricci discovers that he too is capable of being a thief. And in Lena Wertmuller's wonderful film, uh, The Seven Beauties, in which Pasqualino finds out the hard way that selflessness is ultimately better for him than selfishness. So whenever I'm sent a script to direct, or manage to come up with an idea for a film, I try to make sure that there is an X within it that is going to force the protagonist to consider his or her options really carefully, and only then make decisions that are going to leave the audience's minds buzzing as the end credits roll. Thank you.